TI Launchpad. Can't you see I'm busy here? Don't, Don't be held hostage by the board, board order. Go to digikey.com to find thousands of boards in stock, all ready for immediate shipment. Mike Sinisi, and this month we're joined by Sam Brown. This is our regular live build series where we create incredible projects that are powered by really cool high-tech components. And uh, before we get started, uh, I want to uh, say thank you to our sponsor, DigiKey, who uh, is the supplier of all things high-tech, uh, all things uh, components. Uh, if you're looking for your first Arduino board, or if you're looking for a multi-thousand unit order to build some crazy hardware order that you've got, DigiKey will take care of you. And one of the cool things about them is they ship super fast. They're known for being one of the, fa or maybe probably the fastest shipping company in the world. They're, uh, they're, they're an incredible uh, sponsor, incredible partner, and they make, make live possible for us. So uh, speaking of DigiKey uh, and boards, mm -hmm. Sam, uh, you have been a big part of putting together the most recent issue of Make Our Boards Guide, hmm. which we have right here. Yeah, that was uh, fun. Available on newsstands right now. Sam uh, helped uh, curate all of the different boards that are inside of this, uh, including our uh, insert, the Guide to Boards, also sponsored by DigiKey. And so make sure you guys, if you haven't had a chance to pick this up, you run down to the newsstands and you uh, you grab a copy of this while it's... Uh, because there is just about everything you need to know inside of this issue to either get started with working with uh, microcontrollers, single board computers, FPGAs, a lot of FPGAs. Yeah. yeah, and a whole bunch of new developments this year. We saw a whole bunch of new AI boards. We saw a whole bunch of, uh, th there was some development in the mesh world, so boards that talk to each other. You know, that's, yeah, there's some new fun stuff hitting this year. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's always one of our biggest issues to put together, one of our best sellers. Uh, put a lot of effort into it. Sam, thank you very much for putting yeah, my pleasure. A, a lot of effort into this issue. Um, and also thank you for being part of uh, this round of Make Live. Uh, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody what it is we'll be building today. Okay, so we are going to make a xylophone that plays itself. And to make it a little bit fun and interactive, it's going to respond to people or whatever walking up to it. We're going to be using a, a motion sensor. Actually, this is a rangefinder, I should say. This is uh, a classic little uh, rangefinder. This is the HCSR04, just a little cheapy. And, uh, you know, when you don't have a lot going on, this is a great one to throw onto an Arduino because it offloads all the processing to the Arduino, and that makes it really, really, really cheap. And so for simple projects like this, this is a great rangefinder. And then, so that's the sensor side of the project. And then we have the actuator side. What's it actually doing? And what it's actually doing is just hitting these notes, which I should probably not hold in my fleshy fingers <laughs> to actually hear a sound. But we're going to accomplish that with the simplest of all types of motors, solenoids. So these guys don't even spin. They just shoot a pin to one side when we charge them. And that's all they do. Uh, it's about as simple as can be. And Mike has just pointed out one of the things that we have to watch out for, one of the things we have to build around, is there's actually nothing keeping that pin from falling out the bottom. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay. But other things that the solenoid needs for support, the solenoid's running at 12 volts. So our basic, you know, Arduino style board is running at 5 volts. It does not have the voltage, it does not have the amperage to make this thing move at all or with any force. So we're going to have to step up the power. Okay. And our easiest way of doing that, just about, is one of these MOSFETs. And a MOSFET is just a kind of transistor. They have many uses. But these big, beefy MOSFETs are really nice for letting a low-power device, such as our microcontroller, take control of a higher-power device, like this here 12-volt motor. Great. And then for the microcontroller, we've got, uh, it, this is a, a, an Arduino clone, mm -hmm. uh, uh, an Uno R3 variation. Yeah. It's, okay. This is just one of many, many, many knockoffs of the Uno R3. And this project could really be done with pretty much any microcontroller you lay your hands on. There is nothing specific to this project. You could, if you wanted to make this thing network controlled, you could throw it on a one of the new mesh boards. If you wanted it to be responding to facial recognition, you could be doing it with one of the new AI boards. You could, you know, put whatever twist on this you wanted to, but this is going to be the basic, basic version. 
Okay. And that's one of the things I actually really like about this project is that it gets into some of those skills that are just that step past, like you've made your first LED blink, now let's do like what's the next thing? And I feel like this is a good project on that level. This is a lot of fun. Uh, you know, one of the things that we talked about as we were uh, getting this uh, episode together uh, is the name of the project. We dubbed it the Robo Glockenspiel. Uh, Sam, I don't know if you had a, a name for it that you've been calling it internally. Nope. If you guys are watching, uh, you've got the ability to comment, so go ahead and throw questions our way. Uh, but also, if you can think of a good name for this, uh, let us know what you think it should be called, the, uh, the, the person sensing uh, chime setup. One, the, the one that I, I came up with today, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought if I was walking toward this, I might call it, because it's for me, mm -hmm. uh, I would call it the dork bell. It's like doorbell, but mm -hmm. it's because I'm a big dork. Uh, so say we all. <laughs> so yeah, let's hear what you got there and, uh, you know, and go ahead and throw any questions to me or to Sam uh, as you're watching. Uh, but uh, from here, uh, are we ready to build? Yeah, let's start. Okay, what's so, first? Well, the general approach I'm going to take on this is we're going to take the two sides, the input side and the output side, and we're going to kind of look at them both separately first. And then we're going to put them together, and then we're going to throw on the added bells and whistles, or in this case just bells, of actually playing the song. Okay. So a good place to start in my book is getting the rangefinder working. If we can have this thing start triggering things, great. So again, this is Garden Variety HCSR04. It's an an ultrasonic rangefinder. It sends out a little ping of sound, same as a bat, waits to see how long it takes to come back, and the longer it takes, the farther away whatever the first thing it hit was. What's the range on something like this? This guy is reasonably accurate somewhere between, I wouldn't say closer than half a foot, and I wouldn't say farther than yeah, maybe six feet. Okay. Somewhere in that range, you're going to start getting reasonably accurate readings. If you're pointing at something farther away than that, you might not get a reading. And if you're getting something closer than that, yeah, there's other kinds of rangefinders that are more accurate. All right. So is this something that you would see, you know, the, like you've got your car reversing set up and you're backing up and it starts beeping uh, because there's sensors that's built into the bumpers of all these new modern cars. Is it typically ultrasonic? Is it infrared? Uh, I think they are not doing ultrasonic as much that way just because ultrasonic, when you are not in a hobby environment where you're kind of thinking you're the only person using one and you're just using one, then you have to start watching out for like what if someone else sends out a ping while you're listening for your own echo to come back. So like when you have like big complicated robots that have rings of these around, they have to be programmed so that they're only setting them off one at a time because they can interfere with each other. But Again, I just love these as a simple sensor to figure out if something's getting close on little projects like this. Yeah. Very yeah. fun. Mm. Okay, so first thing, we're going to get this plugged in, make sure that it's working. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will watch and learn mm -hmm. as, you, uh, as you put this together. Okay, so we've already got a little bit of pre-work done here. Let me see if I can get this maybe more into frame. Is that going to be stable? I think so. Okay, so we've already got... Um, our microcontroller plugged into our breadboard. We've made two different power rails. That's going to be important later. I'm just going to say for now that we have a 12 volt power rail and we have a 5 volt power rail and never the twain shall meet. Now their grounds are shared. So they both agree what 0 volts is but on this side we're 12 volts above 0 on this side we're 5 volts above 0. And we're going to be using that 12 volts to control our solenoids Oop, and I already dropped a pin. Oop, found it. Okay. I got a feeling that won't be the last time this happens. Oh no, that's <laughs> going to happen over and over and over again. But most other things don't like the 12 volts. Most other things would probably be fried if we fed them 12 volts. So for example, this guy wants to live in the 5 volt world. And so he's going to stay on the 5 volt side of the rail. Now, if you are following along on your computer, this would be a good time to go ahead, pop open your Arduino editor if you don't already have it open. And if you don't already have a library named New Ping, this would be a good time to grab New Ping. You can find it uh, in the standard menu, sketch, uh, add library, manage libraries, and then from there in the search box, look for New Ping. And it's just a classic library for running these little guys. Now, if we look at this guy, he's got four labeled pins. Let me go ahead and read these off to you. We've got VCC, that's just voltage in. That's going to be 5 volts. Uh, one note of caution, if you are using one of the more modern uh, microcontroller boards, 
it might be running at 3.3 volts. And this particular model sensor is not super reliable at that lower voltage. So that's one of the reasons that I chose your basic 5 volt Arduino for this. Got it. Okay. And then on the far side, we've got ground. So there's our basic power loop. That's what's making the thing go. And then in between, we have trigger and echo. So when we send a pulse to trigger, it's telling the thing, send out uh, a sonar ping, and then we wait for a response on the echo pin. And most of that stuff is handled behind the scenes for us in the new ping library. We don't have to do, eh, it would only be like half a dozen line, lines of code, maybe less, but okay. we don't even have to think about it. We've got a library for that. And that's the wonderful thing about the Arduino community and mm -hmm. so many of the other communities now. Mm -hmm. You don't have to think about a lot of these code pieces because they already exist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've certainly, you know, coded these by hand, and it's not like it's that many more lines of code, but it's just one more chance to make a mathematical error. So instead of having to remember the speed of sound or all that stuff, eh, download the library. Okay, so let's get this guy plugged in. First off, let's get the uh, power supply plugged in. That's going to go into our 5-volt power rail. Let's get our ground plugged in. That's going to go into our ground rail. Being a little bit careful not to mix those up. I'm going to go ahead and strip this back some so I can then reach over to uh, our microcontroller. I'm going to remind myself which pins they chose for these in the standard example because Again, speaking of libraries, why code it yourself when there's a pre-built example that you can use to test to make sure you got everything plugged in? Trigger 112, Echo 111. So trigger here is our gray pin. So gray to 12, white to 11. We're going to get those plugged in. And then... What's the word? Have I'm we got at, questions? Uh, looking at some of the, the comments. Uh, our good friend Tyler. Mm -hmm. hey, Tyler, miss you. Uh, he uh, suggests a name, Bing Bongotron, which I kind of like. Yeah, Actually, that, that, that can work. That uh, that feels good coming off your tongue too. Mm -hmm. If you guys uh, try it, say it out loud. If you're watching right now, Bing, Bing Bongotron. Bongotron. It uh, that's a that's a fun one. Yeah. What else do we have in here? Oh, Richard uh, Prevet asks if we know the part number or name for the solenoid. Ah, um, we'll get those posted for you after the show. Don't know it off the top of my head. Uh, this is, it's a 12 volt push dial solenoid. That's what I remember. Um, I'll have to pull the part number for you. Okay. So, we'll get that for you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, a lot of solenoids, if you're just going out there and looking very commonly, I see more pull solenoids out there, which is to say they pull the pin in as opposed to shooting the pin out. For this application, we like the push dial solenoid. Okie dokie. So let's see. Now let me go ahead and just upload the new ping example and pop open the serial monitor and get the baud rate set to match what it is in the code. And there we go. We're starting to get readings of distances. So as I'm waving this around, if I'm pointing at something close enough for it to see, I'm getting readings like, you know, I'm seeing readings of like 60 centimeters flying by. And then when I point it like just off into the distance, this, uh, the new ping library treats that as zero. So that's an important thing to remember. If we're checking to make sure if the distance is closer than something to see if someone has approached, we do have to say if it's closer than something and not zero, because zero could also just mean we see nothing. Yeah. And let me ask Matthew, are you able to pop Sam's screen in? Okay. So let's see if there's a way if we fold this open enough we can show people the uh, the, the serial monitor here Let's just so they can see what you're looking at yeah let me swing this over I'll move some of these things because there's this great window you know and it shows a, a rapid fire readout uh, of yeah of, of and figures and it's little yeah so it's going to be a little tricky to see it from a from and a actually camera. it's kind of handy because it's letting us know that some of these connections aren't great i may want to swap out these wires because I am seeing more zeros flying by than I should be seeing, which suggests to me that I've got either a loose wire somewhere or just one of these wires may be a little bit... Okay, there you go. Now those numbers look... That looks more, more. sane. Right. So it's fluctuating. Again, it is shooting by really quickly, but the numbers, depending on where Sam's pointing this, 
uh, we're seeing zero centimeters, and then as he moves his hand in place, uh, it is uh, then showing 30 centimeters down to 20 centimeters, 19 centimeters. But okay. what's, what did you say, the, the, what's the sampling rate on this, approximately? Uh, it depends on how far out you're reading. You actually, in the Nuping library, you tell it what the max distance that the sensor should be set up to read is. And so if you tell it to only check closer in, it can actually sample faster because the whole thing is based around the time of flight of the sound. Um, mm, I don't remember what kind of milliseconds it takes to bounce at it, the range that it's set for in the example, 200 centimeters max. So, er, some odd milliseconds. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not wild about, I feel like we may have a loose wire in there. We may, we may come back and revisit that. But for now, we're going to go on ahead as if that's not broken. Sounds good. Okay. So, next thing we care about is we want to start seeing these solenoids move. So that's going to be our output. And really, the whole application here is going to be making the solenoids ring at the right time, making the solenoids bash into uh, our little glockenspiel parts in the right place at the right time. From my point of view, the programming side of this is actually the easy side of it. Uh, the hardest part is always the carpentry where you put together the frame that holds all the solenoids and gets the position just so. Yeah. Uh, and so for this case, you actually dismantled part of the glockenspiel that you brought in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you are going to rebuild a new frame for it that mm -hmm. will hold the solenoids. Uh, you, know, there, there's, you were mentioning before that there's a little element of making sure you're in the the harmonic nodes as well? Yes. We'll so, probably get to that, but. Yeah, let's go ahead and just show a teeny bit of that. So let me get this under the main camera. If you take a look at the glockenspiel with some of the notes ripped out, the four notes we need for our song, you'll see that they've got these pegs that are holding the notes in place. We're also going to rip those out and use them for our project. They also have these foam pads, and if you'll notice, the foam pads actually move in closer and closer as we get to the smaller notes, and that's not a coincidence. When these, uh, when these keys are ringing, keys, bells, chimes, when they're ringing, there's a certain pattern they bend. There's a certain place where, like, if the two ends of the glockenspiel are flexing up and down as they make the noise, and the center is kind of bowing up and down, there's a place where they're kind of rocking on, and we're gonna preserve the most energy if that's the spot that it's resting on. Because if it's resting on one of the spots that's bumping up and down, that's gonna drain energy out of the system faster, the note's gonna be quieter sooner. And so by putting our padding underneath the spot that kind of is the place that it's bending on, we're robbing the system of the least energy possible. That okay. makes sense? It does, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, as someone that spent a lot of time trying to learn how to play guitar as a kid, mm -hmm. Uh, the concept of harmonics and wave uh, dynamics make general sense to me. Yeah. You can probably imagine that most of you guys are the same way. We all grew up wanting to be rock stars. Indeed. So I got to do this because I, I yeah, before it hear. goes away. Nice. Mm. This is going to sound cool. Hopefully. Okay. So let's see. So now we want to get uh, the solenoids firing. So as the first simplest test, not even using the intelligence of our microcontroller, we're going to do two things. We're going to plug this uh, the solenoid in. We are also going to use the last part we haven't talked about yet. This is just a plain old diode, not even a light emitting diode. So this is a uh, one in four thousand seven, I think, is what I grabbed. And the reason we need one of these is because the solenoid, when we fire it, it actually ends up storing a lot of energy in its magnetic coils. And when we stop applying voltage to it, that energy can be dumped back into the system very, very quickly. And it has the potential to damage some of the more fragile components. Right. So right. we add what's called a flyback diode that basically only allows current to flow in that reverse direction. So it creates this safe loop for the energy to dissipate when the solenoid drains. So sort of an energy valve. Yeah, exactly. It's an escape valve for the energy that's been built up inside the solenoid's magnetic coil. And so you can skip that, but if your components don't work as well the next day. <laughs> you may have fried your board. So um, for our first test, we are going to put our flyback diode in first. And we're just going to put it in 
um, across our 12 volt power rail and ground. And if I get this wrong, I'll short the entire system. We're gonna have a lot of fun with that. But in general, the way our diode works, if we look at this guy, well, that could be printed more boldly. There's a silver band around one side of the diode. And if you think of that as the direction the current should be flowing, if we're using a standard current notation, so that silver ring is on the side that the positive current is flowing towards, towards the negative side, towards ground. That's the way that's normally going. So we're gonna put this in backwards. We're gonna put it in such that that silver ring is pointed towards the positive side. And that way it's only going to let electricity flow in reverse. Whee! Okay, now just to kind of demonstrate the song, I'm gonna push this back, because again, that's totally fiddly. I'm gonna put this in power and this in ground, and as soon as this guy touches ground, as soon as our circuit's completed, you're gonna see a little... There it oh, goes. That's it, and that's all the action. Um, this whole project is about controlling that. Okay. That's it. Should we try to do that one more time and get yeah. a good shot from this overhead camera? Okay, yeah, let's yeah, move this right. up a little bit. So I'm gonna manually push this back, because again, this solenoid has no spring. We're gonna work around that in a bit. And if I touch that there, now it's being pulled in. And I push it back manually, boop, there we go. That's the whole thing. That's what's gonna ring the chimes of our Lockenspiel. Now, let's talk about how we are gonna work around that. So there's nothing causing this to reset after it's fired. That's what I was wondering. And there's also nothing stopping it from falling out. Which it's done multiple times already. Mm -hmm. So we are gonna have to play a fun little dance with gravity and positioning, and that's where our frame comes in. We are gonna have three plates held together by hot glue, because we pros, and these are going to keep everything where it's supposed to be. If you look at this little solenoid, it has a hex nut on the top, and we can place it through one of these guys. And so that's gonna hold it where it's supposed to be to hit the note. Great, and then let's bring it right over here so everybody can see that yeah. setup right Whee! there. Okay, so. So you've got on the bottom here, you've got the, you got the solenoid yep. screwed into the top. Yep, we got this little hex nut holding it in place. That's what's keeping it clamped onto this board. So, now we need to have another board up top regulating how far the notes are off that. Because we, uh, we want the pin to kind of reach up and strike the note near the apex of how far it's gonna go. That's when it's gonna build up the most energy, that's when it's gonna be the loudest. You know, this is still not a super high power system. Right. We wanna get as much out of it as we can. So we're gonna use the second board sitting over the top of that first board in order to get the spacing right on that. Okay. And then the final board sits underneath the entire mess and that's what stops the pin from falling out the bottom. Ah. So this is gonna be a big sandwich stack and everything is gonna be spaced just so, this is the thing that we are most likely to screw up in the course of doing this build, where you know, the top board is getting the spacing right so we ring the note loudly and the bottom board is getting the spacing right so the pin falls just far enough that we can still grab it. And uh, that's gonna be the trickiest part of this whole build. Okay. Well. Okay. Now, let's introduce the one more bit of easy, easy electrical engineering we're gonna do along the way before we get to building that frame. Let me put this back on here before I lose it. And throw that back in there before I lose it. And whoop. Okay, so the last trick we're gonna use is the old MOSFET. So this guy, again, his job in this circuit is to allow the low power microcontroller to control the high power solenoid. This is, you know, what relays the commands from the low power world to the high power world. For me, MOSFETs, uh, I'm most familiar with them, again, as a uh, failed rock star. Uh, mm -hmm. I always remembered, uh, growing up with two types of guitar amplifiers. Mm. You had the classic vacuum tube mm -hmm. transistor amplifiers, which had that analog tone, warm, rich, and then you crank up 
the, the gain and you get a nice crunchy uh, distortion out of them. Mm -hmm. But then all the modern amps used MOSFETs. Mm. And power amps, you, know, you would get like big power amps for PAs and they were all MOSFET powered. So it's funny you know, to, to see them used in probably in more appropriate situations. Um, you know, but it, essentially, you know, it sounds like you're describing something that's a, an amplifier. Yeah. Take the low, the low voltage and turn it into the high voltage. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, this thing's basically going to act like a solid state switch. When our microcontroller sends a signal, it's going to allow power to pass through it. When it's not receiving that signal, when it's getting ground on that pin, it's not going to allow power to pass. There you go. Okay. So it's basically a gatekeeper for the high power level. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and plug this guy in. Any arbitrary uh, set O columns on our breadboard. Uh, quick briefing here, the three pins on the MOSFET are named gate, drain, and source. We won't go into what those names mean or why they're named that. It never entirely made sense to me anyway, but the gate pin, that one makes sense. That's the one that is kind of the gatekeeper pin. Right. That's the one that we are gonna plug our microcontroller into, and then it's going to allow or disallow electricity to flow between the other two pins. So, on that note, let me see here. Building towards the program, that we are building towards. I said three was the first one. Let me see. Would you grab me one of the mail to mail jumpers over there? Do I have mail to mail jumpers? Oh, there we go. So we're going to go ahead and grab an arbitrary one of these. We're going to plug it into the gate pin. Uh, the way I'm facing, you know, with as I view it, the MOSFET facing me, that's the leftmost pin. And then I'm going to plug the other side of that into ND3. 0, 1, 2, 3. Oh, and already we've had an unplug. Wait a, oh, no, we haven't. That's just one of our solenoids. Woo! Trying to get in on the action early. Let's get those out of the way for now. Okay. And then the way this is going to work, we're going to still plug the solenoid in to the 12 volt power on that side. We're going to plug. the ground wire of the solenoid into the middle pin of the MOSFET. That's our drain pin. So you can kind of think of electricity as draining through the drain pin. That name sort of makes sense. Yeah. And then, let's see, do we have a bundle of black jumper wires anywhere handy? Which one are the uh, let's see. black I think jumper wires? Are that's one. I probably got more tucked away somewhere. But we, oh, that's great. It's short ones. That's perfect. So. Last pin on the MOSFET, the source, so the source of ground, the source of, elec of electrons. Someone who knows semiconductors better than me know why these pins are named what they are. Okay, so that's our three pins going into the MOSFET. We've got gate running to our, our microcontroller. We've got drain running to the ground wire of our solenoid. We've got source running to the ground of the circuit. And then the second wire of the solenoid is running straight to power. So basically, power would like to flow through the solenoid and make it trigger, but until it gets a signal on, uh, on that gate pin, it's not going to be allowed. Got it. And so that's how our 5-volt microcontroller controls this 12-volt motor yep. without 12 volts ever touching and cooking this thing. So the, yeah, so the, the, it's a, a relay type situation. Yeah, a relay would be the, the, the hardware equivalent. Yeah. So. There's trade-offs there. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and just add some code into our new ping example. I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to just throw in an if um, sonar dot ping centimeters uh, is less than say 30. So if something is reading closer than 30 centimeters, and sonar dot ping centimeters is also not equal to zero because we know that's just a null reading. Then I'm going to tell it to digital write that pin three to high, so it's going to fire that solenoid. And the rest of the time, else, it's going to digital write pin three to low. So we're just going to basically say any time uh, this rangefinder says that there's something within 30 centimeters. We're going to go ahead and fire that solenoid. And anytime there's not, the solenoid can be relaxed. Great. Yeah, this thing's ready to go. Let's do it. All right. Oh, no.
Ooh, we forgot our flyback diode. Oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, let's see. Our flyback diode, we need to throw this between power and ground such that... Let's see, can I reach this without getting more wires into the system? Okay, so normally uh, the band would be pointing towards ground. This time we point the band towards power. You know what? I'm going to move this whole thing over. Let's unplug it for a second and shift this over so it's closer to the power side so I can get this diode where it needs to go. And then we plug our Arduino back in, our source back in, our drain back in, and then before we fire anything up, we get this plugged in facing what would normally be the opposite of the right way, but for a flyback diode, that is correct. So, silver end towards power, and other end into, oh, sorry, other end into this middle pin, there we go. I think that's right. Okay, so we're now protected from uh, the flyback current. Okay, should we uh, hold that, this up? If I hold it up to show the camera nice and close, will it fall apart? Uh, probably not. Okay, go for it. Let's give you guys a real quick peek of this. I'm going to do it to this overhead cam here so you guys can get a, a good look of how Sam has put these components together. It's, a, it's about as far as I feel And as he's it. holding that, I'm going to go ahead and upload the new program. This thing's not on, is it? Nah. Okay. This side. Oh, there we go. So you can see our solenoid going to the power rail. We've got our diode to the MOSFET. We've got our gate. Uh, what's the middle? Oh, uh, gate drain and source. Gate. Yeah. Uh, okay. Source goes to the solenoid, drain goes to the solenoid on the black line, and then source goes back to the, uh, to the grounding rail. Yeah, this looks good. Okay, and so now we're uploading the program after a teeny bug fix. So, if I pick this up, and so it's currently saying zero, so it shouldn't be fired. It should be relaxed right now, is it? And it's not. It's right not. It okay. I'm feeling, I'm feeling a good amount of pressure. Yeah. On this okay. Well, something's it. not right yet. Then. Okay. Let's check our wiring. Well, first off, let's also that didn't relax it. Nope. Okay. So something is wrong. Let's debug. Yay. Um, first off, is this indeed plugged into pin three? Okay, that's first check done. And that's in gate, that's in drain, that's in source, ground. Do we agree on what ground is? Maybe that was loose. Oh, and also, now is it relaxed? No, that wasn't it. Okay. Hmm, what else could I be messing up? Okay, live debugging, always the most fun. This is the best part of make live. Yeah. It's where we get to figure little things out. If you guys have ideas, if you noticed something as we were putting this together that might be backwards, we might be bridging something. Yeah. Pause it in the comments. You can become part of the build. Mm-hmm. Flyback diode looks correct. I'm going to risk pulling the flyback diode for a second just to make sure that's not throwing things off. Okay. Nope, still triggering. That wasn't it. Let's get you back in the circuit. I have a hard time seeing the silver band on this model diode. towards power. Robert McFarland writes, the pin never goes low. The pin never goes low. That, that like does a, seem to be what's happening. Sounds um, like a good name for an indie rock song. <laughs> um, I mean,
mean, that certainly would do it if my code had a bug there. Let's go ahead and clean up the code a little bit. Let's go ahead and take our distance reading once at the top. We're going to assume the existence of a variable name distance. We're going to set it equal to sonar dot ping centimeters. And then everywhere that we use sonar ping centimeters, we're just going to reference that one variable distance. That usually makes things easier to read, usually makes bugs jump out. And so we need to define the existence of that variable, int distance. Uh, we'll start it at the value of zero. And we'll throw some parens in here just to be extra double clear. And then to write three high, to write three low, and we double check that we were plugged into three. Noticing that our solenoid's getting pretty warm too. Well, it's got 12 volts flowing through it. Yeah. That's yeah. that is operating as expected, but it's still fire. Yeah, it's still firing. Okay, why is? Do we just have a plain old-fashioned short? <laughs> So we can see that we're getting good readings in. Let's do the classic thing where we actually have the program report on what it thinks it's doing. Never take for granted when the program could tell you what it believes is correct. And how do you do that? So we're going to throw in a serial.print line into this if where we're setting the pin high or low. And so we can see if it thinks it's setting the pin high or low. We can see if the program thinks it's behaving correctly. So I'm going to say serial print line firing on one side, and I'm going to say serial print line relaxed on the other. And by doing this, we see if, you know, this helps us figure out if this is a coding bug versus a wiring bug. We can see if the program believes it's behaving properly. And so it believes it's relaxed. Interesting. Okay. So that suggests a wiring issue. That's pretty hot. Yeah. Yeah. We can go ahead and pull it from here if we want to let it cool down. And that, yep, yeah, there we go. Um, okay. I'm just going to stare at this thing. This is the exciting part of the program. So power's coming in on the red line. Yep. Yeah. Or it is, except for now. Except for now. Yeah. And then it should be flowing out the black line. Mm -hmm. Should be going to. That is indeed in its own column. Yep. And that is indeed the middle column, as it should be. And then outside most column is indeed going to the ground rail. Ground rail. Both ground rails are tied together. That's important. And ground is indeed grounded over here. And hmm. No, that's still plugged into three. Let's go ahead and try just a different wire plugging to three. And oh. Simon writes, use a pull-down resistor on the gate to ground. Well, the Arduino should be pulling that down when we tell it to go low. Let's force it to ground and see if that relaxes it. Yes, it does. So why is pin three? Huh. Uh, interactive DNA writes, turn all off first, power back on, system overload. Uh, that sounds like the uh, classic reboot the computer mm -hmm. technique, which seems to work a lot. Sure, let's go ahead and do it. Let's go ahead and pull the plug on the Arduino. We're not going to reboot the full laptop if we can help it. That no, would, that's, yeah. That's probably fine. Okay, plug this guy back in. And I'm going to even 
go ahead and once we can see the port, maybe try, we think we can already see the port. Try re-uploading the program so that we could see from the serial monitor that it was doing that before. Okay, it thinks it's mostly relaxed every now and again it says it's firing, but it isn't. Whoop. Nope, that was me overpowering it. That was not it actually being relaxed. Well, the good news, I found another pin on the over there. Like we said, we've lost a lot of these pins already. Uh, second vote for using the pull-down resistor. Okay, let's and give then, it a shot. And then one other comment from the same voter, or the second mm -hmm. voter, who said, why not check manually the D-gate pin to check the MOSFET? Which pin? Uh, why not check manually the... the uh, I don't know if that means the gate pin. Mm. To check the MOSFET. Why not check manually the gate pin to check the MOSFET? Let's go, okay, let's go ahead and try the pull down resistor first. So I see we have a wall of yeah. common components over there. Yep. Can I get you to grab me, how about just a 10 kilo ohm? Or anything in that rough range. Thank you, sir. Okay, so we're going to run that from the gate pin to ground, is that going to roll, huh, okay, you know, I think I found the first time that this particular model clone has, uh, has failed me, normally with uh, the brand name Arduinos, you, uh, when you set them to low, they ground, this one did not, let's confirm that it does indeed pop when we, <laughs> so now it thinks it's firing, but it's not, okay. Right. So we've got it relaxed. Now it's stuck relaxed. Reverse to the situation here. Pin is relaxed, it's not firing. At all. Next. And I keep checking to make sure it's plugged into three. It is plugged into three. You know what, I'm just gonna distrust pin three. Okay. Let's say pin four. And Edwin Norlander writes, if you put the pin, or if you put the gate pin to ground, and then he just leaves it at that. Okay, we're plugged into four. So now, it's saying relaxed. It says it's firing, but it's not. Are we sure this is a 10,000 kilo ohm? Let's double check. A 10,000 ohm? Yeah, no, it's, it's in the 10,000, it is 10,000 ohms. It's brown, black, orange. That is as, as it should be. And as soon as we pull it, it's locked. How is a 10,000 ohm resistor overpowering a live power supply? Because once I plug this back in, you're gonna go relaxed again, aren't you? Yeah, you are. How is that overpowering the microcontroller's own supply? Oh! because I haven't set a pin mode in this program. So I was taking for granted that this pin was already defined. Uh, There's oh. our bug. So uh, in the Arduino editor, you set all pins to either be input or output. And if you don't write anything, they default to input, which means they have a built-in resistor, which depending upon which model of Arduino or clone you have, that resistor has different values. It's usually in the some odd kilo ohm range more than this resistor. That's why this resistor is overpowering the pin. So this was my bug. I didn't, in the setup when I added pin three or now pin four, I did not turn around and say pin mode for output so that it could actually be driving significant power. Okay. And so when you write pin mode and then you've got four, what's the four really? Uh, what's so the four is just setting which number pin it is. Oh, because you moved at. to pin four. I moved it to four, yeah. Okay. And as part of the debugging, right. you know, I was like, I'm not sure I trust pin three. Right. So I remember you saying that. Yeah. And then you, it's, you switched. It. And so now, let's see if this does it. So now, it's loading, it says it's relaxed, and then if we, oh, there we go, it triggered, and then now it. that it's relaxed again, yep, and yes, okay, that was our bug. Our bug was that I never wrote the pin mode command <laughs> in the Great. setup. Thanks, everybody, for her. Helping us with all those suggestions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Indeed. Okay. Here so, we go. so now we have an output being controlled by an input. Now we just have to build a frame and add the song. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so the frame is going to be the trickiest part of this whole deal. So I have a question real quick. That Shoot. 10K resistor you added, is that yes. doing anything or is that just extra in the circuit? Um, we should be able to pull this now. The This 10K resistor, again, in general, one of these microcontroller boards, typically once you tell it to set a pin to low, it's going to ground that pin. Let's test it. Let's pull this. Uh, pull the pull-down resistor and see if things still work. So it's still, still, relaxed, still relaxed, and then yeah. triggers, and then goes back to being relaxed. Oh, but if the pin is too far out, so that's, okay, check this. If we push this too far back, it's too far away from the magnetic coil sometimes. If we get this where it's barely in there, yeah, it fails to grab. So that's one of the things we have to watch out for when we're building the frame. Good to know. Very good to know. Okay. So again, our plan for this frame is we're going to have this middle layer that all of these solenoids, I'm going to lose those pins, <laughs> are going to be hanging on to. We're going to have a top layer that the pins are going to be able to uh, launch through. So the holes here are a little bit bigger uh, than the size of the pins themselves. And then we're going to have a bottom layer that's just a flat board stopping the pins from falling too far out. Now, my wildly sophisticated scheme for making this whole thing work is toothpicks, sidewalls, and hot glue, because we fancy like that. That is nice. So my general plan is to figure out what height each of these three layers need to be at, make a little shelf, um, starts with a C, there's a word for that in architecture, that then... Killer. Uh, there's a different word I want. I'm not going to remember it. Okay. And so basically we're going to make three shelves that these are going to sit on to get them at the right height. But first we need to figure out what that height is. So this calls for another one of our vastly sophisticated tools. Well, I see we have our calipers, but we just have a plain old-fashioned ruler floating around. I've got a feeling we do. Yeah. In our ruler's drawer. Sweet. Ooh. Or this one's a little bit smaller and a little oh. bit brighter, so uh, it's an Shit. option as well. Yep. Heck, show sponsored by DigiKey. Let's use the DigiKey branded ruler. Okay. And it's in centimeters too. How nice. Oh, it's a PCB. <laughs> okay. So, basically, we want to figure out, we want to grab one of these solenoids and say, from roughly the peak of the solenoid to the peak of the pin, how far is that firing going to be? So, we could do this with our calipers, but... I'm seeing 13 millimeters. Okay, I feel like we should be scribbling this down before I forget it. I've Up comes it. the notepad. I've got this. And paper. Okay, so let's say um, so full extensions 13 millimeters. Full extensions 13 millimeters, and as long as there's some of that pin poking out the end, we know this can still grab. And at that point, yeah, there's about 12 or 13 millimeters uh, poking out the bottom. So our goal is going to be to have the solid bottom plate end up 13 millimeters from the bottom of this solenoid. Keeping in mind that we're, what we're actually anchoring the solenoid to is the top part of this, so we're going to have to figure out the distance of this whole barrel plus 13 millimeters. Got it. And because we can do arithmetic, so I'm getting uh, 25, 26 millimeters for that. Let's say 25. So 25 plus 13, 38. Can I do math? Is that That's a right. thing? Okay. You got it. Okay. So we want 38 millimeters of space between uh, this middle plate and this bottom plate. And then our goal is to have it so that. When this, uh, when this system is firing, 
first off, let's check and make sure that no more of this is popping out than we think is. So if this is poking out the top, some of it is poking out the top. Of course it is. What else would we not grab one to if it wasn't? So subtracting out the height that we're gaining from the bit that the nut's grabbing onto, which looks like about, yeah, I'm getting two millimeters. Ooh, we're gonna do it the fancy way. We're gonna do this. Oh yeah. One of the uh, precision. One of one of the caliper tricks that mm -hmm. I just find so fun. There's so many different uh, ways to use these calipers. Oh, this is in inches. Let's change it to millimeters. Three point three okay. nine millimeters for that uh, nut and okay. thread. So, and here's the other thing that's going to throw our calculations off that we need to take into account. When we get these posts put in, and when we get, we're going to totally hot glue those in place, and when we get the uh, notes resting on some bumpers, so they aren't just falling flat on the thing, what then is the height of this? I, oh, because that's not a Ziploc. No, it does look like a Ziploc. I don't blame you. That's good. I can blame me enough for both of us. Okay. So. If we throw one of these bumpers on in the same position it was that that foam pad was, which is to say right next to the rest. And another, ooh, good yeah, organization. Some parts bins for yeah, solenoid that's bins forward that thinking. And so again, we're gonna throw another one of these little silicone bumpers on here for the note to rest on. And this is the bit where we just kind of grab the pin out of the xylophone and say, you come with me. Let me get that out of the way. I'm a little bit concerned about crushing that. Get a nice clear work surface. Okay. There we go. That's uh, the scientific way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Precision. Okay, so now we need to find out when we put the note, that's going to be our low D. There we go, our orange note. We pop that back into position. Oh, no, that's not. That's going to be our be a. high A. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let me put it this way just so that I'm keeping a, the orientation the same as it is on the original xylophone because that just feels more comfortable. <laughs> These bumpers are a little bit higher. So maybe what I do is I thread these through first and rest it down on there after. Yeah. Or I could just, you know, push it through from the easy side first. That would make sense. Okay, so that's there, that's there. These pop through here, and now the all-consuming question, what we went through this whole exercise for prior to gluing that in place, was, oh, that's right, the bumpers are round. We have to add something to, to flatten these out. Otherwise, it's gonna kind of wobble. What okay. if we used your same technique where you just tear some of that foam off? I think we can probably harvest this back out. We were never planning on keeping the xylophone intact. It is here to supply us with parts. Thank you, xylophone. Yeah, your sacrifice is not in vain. Okay, so let's see. If we pop that silicone off, and then if we just hot glue that in place, that'll do. Oh, yeah. It's ugly, but it'll work. Mm -hmm. well, I hope it works. <laughs> we'll find out. So the hot glue gun should be, speaking of, 
We got Matthew over here shaking his head saying it's not ugly. So thank you, Matthew. Appreciate your support. <laughs> okay, so speaking of things that are ugly, let me go ahead and get this framed as opposed to doing stuff where you all can't see it. And we're going to go ahead and just get a little dab of that hot glue down here and then hopefully move fast enough before that cools off and get this bumper wetted into that hot glue. Yeah, that'll do. Okay. So I've got a hot glue trick that I figured out recently. Ooh. Uh, one of my big complaints about hot glue has mm -hmm. always been how it's just so darn ugly. And it's mm -hmm. stringy. You put it on something and it bubbles up and one side oozes out. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, of course you get the, you know, the, 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 the tendrils of it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I've had things that I've put together or repaired using hot glue and I've always hated the way they looked. And then it occurred to me, after years of this, mm -hmm. that a hot air gun with a couple seconds blast on some hot glue that's showing remelts it smooths it out and makes it kind of pretty. No, 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 not pretty. I shouldn't say pretty. It makes it acceptable. I feel like we've got uh, a hot air that's, gun that's around my here somewhere. Yeah. If you guys are looking to uh, fix up a little bit of your hot glue mess, uh, toss a little bit of hot Let's air. Let's give this a try. There we go. So here's our little uh, spot uh, heat gun. Can we reach? Is it going to work? It's a of a plug. Ah, it's almost as if we have a lot of electronics in this room. I'm up this one up here, Matthew. We could probably stretch it off of that. Yeah, we're only going to do this for, for if, once anyway. It doesn't need to stay dark, plugged in. because we've uh, successfully put too much electricity through our circuit breakers, which is possible. And awesome. Okay, so let's try this technique. So I'm going to apply the hot glue. You're going to demonstrate the fix? Sure, yeah. Okay, yeah. oh, and first we need to harvest from here. Let's get our foam that we're then going to use. Just peel, 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 peel. And that's the full length we're gonna need. Boom. Okay, so that looks sane. Now, hot glue gun is on. Okay. Let's see this. Put it to the test. All right, so a little globby. It's also a great way to um, rework to rework some glue that's started to uh, to harden. Get in there. I mean, basically, all you're doing is just melting it back down so that it uh, it oozes back out. Hmm. Uh, I had a tripod, little Go like a GoPro mm -hmm. style, um, like Gorilla Pod style tripod that I had repaired a leg that had popped off. It had big chunks of hot glue on the side. Okay, go ahead and toss that on. Okay. There. It had big chunks of hot glue coming out the side, and plus I think like a thumbprint from me jamming mm -hmm. it in place and holding it there. And there's something really diabolical about hot glue. It's hot, and it's glue, so when you get it on yourself, it burns, and it doesn't come off because it's glued to you. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, so I, uh, I was able to, after a long time, this is when I realized that this technique made sense, uh, I was able to finally make that tripod not look so, hey. just, so atrocious. And who knew? the actual original piece works better than uh, the silicon bumper. It's almost as if it was engineered for the purpose. <laughs> That's great. It okay. looks awesome. There we go. So let's go ahead and harvest the rest of these pins out of here, and then we're going to flip this over and hot glue those pins in place. Okay. And then once we've done that, we can measure where these are sitting to get back to that calculation we were doing a moment ago. So let me go ahead and just move some of this stuff a little more out of the way so we can do violence to our sacrificial xylophone. Okay. Uma. I feel like I should put some safety goggles on while you're doing that. Here you go. Pretty 
Probably I should too. Thank you. There, you can use yours. These are yours. You brought you brought your own pair, and they, they look better on you than they do on me. These ones. These ones are great. We give these out uh, in the past. You know we have given these out at Maker Fair. They're uh, the Google Making Science uh, uh, sponsored goggles. And uh, speaking of Maker Fair. We've got Maker Faire coming up in a couple weeks, and those of you who are in the Bay Area, uh, I strongly urge you to uh, to come. If you haven't been before, Maker Faire is one of the most amazing events uh, that has ever been created, and I say that without exaggeration. Uh, if you guys have been before, you know what I'm talking about, and you may be coming, but it's uh, May uh, 17th to the 19th. Tickets are available now, makerfair.com. Uh, DigiKey will be a sponsor there as well, so you can see uh, a lot of their great stuff. You can see the board's guide in action there, which uh, will be uh, debuting. <laughs> yeah, he's putting his goggles on back there, though. So. Uh, board's guide will have some new features that we're going to be uh, announcing very soon. Surprise, fun stuff that uh, is really exciting. Uh, so yeah, make sure to uh, make sure to be there. If you uh, aren't in the Bay Area, uh, go ahead and grab those plane tickets and, uh, and get here because it's worth it. It is one of my favorite events of the year. So Edwin's asking, what song is he going to play? You want to tell him or you want to surprise him? No spoilers. No spoilers. Yeah, I guess we're, we're so so close. Well, maybe not. You're we'll see. You're going to have to stay tuned in to find out. So your notes are D, E, F, and A. What songs do you know that we're only going to go for the first few bars? Within the first few bars, those are the only notes we use. You all have access to the internet right now. I bet <laughs> you, you can find out. But do it in a different browser window. Don't close this one. Yeah. It's important. There we go. Okay, so we've harvested some pins and some spares just in case we bent any. Our xylophone is looking more and more sacrificial. Your sacrifice is appreciated, little xylophone. Please tell me that wasn't your favorite childhood xylophone. This was something I, I snagged on Amazon mere days before this broadcast. Okay. So let's see. So I'm going to throw. There's a similar a, a story along those lines that I'll tell as you're assembling this. Mm -hmm. This was, uh, it was about 10 years ago. I was auditioning for a TV show. I did a couple TV shows a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It was the first one I'd ever done, and so we were. I, I flew down to LA for this, and I just had nothing uh, to expect in my head. It was this, you know, kind of weird enough for me to even be there in the first place. Uh, and they put us in this room, uh, in this warehouse that was where they filmed a couple of the first, the first couple Saw movies. So okay. dark, kind of creepy. Uh, and they're filming this room full of people. They're kind of mixing and matching, doing sort of a mixing and matching of, of combinations of people to see how they would interact together. And they had right. all these broken electronics and musical instrument pieces there. And the whole theme of the show was kind of like a rock and roll style of Mythbusters. So they wanted to see what we could do with the pile of junk that they had presented with us. Now, one of the things that was there was an electric guitar. And of course, one of the people uh, that was doing the audition thought that he would be a real, uh, real badass with his guitar. And, okay, so this is where, you know, he got on the camera, ah, this is what we're doing, we're going to do rock and roll, we're going to do that. All right, and he took the guitar and he smashed it, rock and roll style. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys behind the camera's face just sank. Turns out that was his childhood guitar that he had brought in as a favor to have <laughs> some extra stuff there for people mm -hmm. to use. So anyways, uh, thank you for not... <laughs> Destroying your favorite childhood xylophone. <laughs> no such worries. Your most, okay. Your most precious musical uh, uh, instrument. Of all time. So, okay, so you got all the pins in. We got all those through, and again, we're doing this obviously the super fancy way. You know, this is how the pros do it with hot glue. Just globbed on like okay. crazy. And if it goes bad, I will blast it with some hot air. Yeah. We've got our backup plan already. How about that? I don't know, venomous hot glue could... Maybe you're right. <laughs> I'm, Glasses are going back on. I was being entirely sarcastic. 
Okay, so in a few moments that should have cooled down enough that we can flip it over and take our measurement. And give it a moment more. Gluing, the exciting part of the show. Yes. <laughs> if only we had a cold air gun. It's a good invention. Somebody can make a million dollars right now. There you go. We're giving the ideas away. You guys just have to build them. Okay, so now, so back to the goal, back to the reason why we were doing this. We need to know if we add back three millimeters from here, as mm -hmm. you measured it, 3.3, I think it was. Um, what is the distance if, so we need to go 13 more millimeters to the bottom of this, or slightly less than 13 millimeters. We want to make sure that we hit it, not that we ran out of steam before we get there. So maybe, let's say, 2 millimeters spare, let's say 11. So, yeah, so now we need to know how much height we just added to these with that padding and that glue. Okay. Nice. Specifically, how much height we added to the bottom. Right. So... Is it zeroed out? Good question. Yes. So, if we measure it from one side, oh, well, that's tricky to, okay. If we place a thumb on this so that it can't go anywhere. I gotcha. Thank you. Then let's do a few of these to, about two. Okay. Right there. Yeah, 1.7, 1.75, let's say 1.5. Let's also, let's do one or two more just in case that one reading was a fluke. 1.5. Hold on, you're on in inches. It keeps going back. Let's Millimeters, let's thank you. Start over. Okay. Back to this one. Boop. 3.5. Oh, 3.5. That makes more sense. Good catch. 4.6, but I'm pushing it up some when I push down about 4. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, let's play it safe. If we sacrifice a little power by not going to the full extent, um, let's say that we're leaving two millimeters in the tank. Let's say that we're taking the low end reading of three millimeters that we're adding. So we're looking to add um, yeah, about eight millimeters between the end of this and the bottom of this, or 11 millimeters between the end of this and the bottom of this. So eight millimeters between the end of this and the top of this. And so now let's check the thickness of this, about five millimeters. So that's another five we have to subtract out. So we really only want to have about three millimeters between these two plates, if I'm running my math right. How about that studio audience? Was that math right? So tell me again, what do you think, we, what do we need? I'm thinking that if we have a, about... We've got five plus three, yeah, so, so we've got eight, so... And then about three more uh, uh, between, right. the two, between the top of this and the bottom of this. Right. So, oh, and then we had about three more here, so I guess actually six, right. Um, so six millimeters between these two. And then that should get us about the stroke, the stroke length that we want. Okay, distance. Six. So, and the distance to the bottom was 18, was it? No, barrel of oh, 38. Okay. So what we're saying then is if we grab a sharper writing implement and we grab a handy dandy ruler, if all our math is correct, and what are the odds? Let's say that we start two centimeters off the ground. And then, so we're going to make our cornice, is that the word I want? Hmm. Uh, there. The, the architectural yeah, that's, 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 that's term what, that you're looking for? I, I, I don't know. I wonder what it could be. Mm. Corbel. Corbel. Our corbel. We're, we're putting a corbel there. I'm 
embarrassed to say that I've never heard that word. Um, I might be too into medieval architecture. <laughs> um, so we're going to put a corbel uh, here. And then that's what the first plate's going to rest on top of. And then if we then turn around and put the next plate 38 millimeters above that, so if that's 20 off, then we are going up to 58. I'm Googling corbels while you're. C O R B E L. That's a word for bracket. Hmm. Me. All right, according to trusty Wikipedia, in architecture, a corbel is, in medieval architecture, a structural piece of stone, wood, or metal jutting from a wall to carry a superincumbent weight, a type of bracket. Why am I still wearing these? <laughs> Great. All right, cool. Thank you, Sam. I learned mm. something new and totally unexpected. This was, uh, outside of the stuff that I thought that I'd be learning about today. Okay. So let's see, so now, so we've said if the bottom plate is going to there and the middle plate is going to there, now I'm realizing we didn't take into account the thickness of this plate, or did we? Of the acrylic? Well, I think we're good. I thought that we had, yeah. but maybe we haven't. This is one of those places we actually need to double check ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Okay. So, our goal being to get. Can we uh, just illustrate this? Or yeah, let's do that. Draw this out. Yeah, that's smart. Let's use visual reasoning. Okay. okay. So, so bottom plate. So bottom. the top of the bottom plate, we want to be 38 millimeters away from the bottom of the middle plate. And then there exists the thickness of the middle plate, which I don't think we've measured yet. So let's just add a line for that for now. Okay. About three millimeters. And then we know that the solenoid rises another three millimeters above that. said that we intend to put six millimeters between these two, so three more millimeters on top of that. And then that's for the, uh, for the bumper, for the rise of the bumper plus the, uh, plus the chime, right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's to the bottom of the uh, top plate. To the bottom of the top plate, correct, yeah. right, right. right. Okay. And then we go through the top plate and we go the additional three millimeters, I think we said it was. Yeah, so it's five millimeters through the top plate. And that is the distance of the top plate plus? Well, that's just the, the, that's just the thickness of the top plate oh, itself. That's a, oh, the top plate, that's thick. Yeah. Okay, so this one's a five. That's and then, that a lot thinner than right. The and then we were putting a lower bound estimate of three millimeters on the added height from? From the chime. Yeah, thanks to the padding. So, our goal is to have the distance from the top of the solenoid, so to the bottom of the chime, add up to about 11. So three more here, five more here, that's eight. Three yep. more here, that's 11. Okay, life appears to be good. Simon does bring up a point. Mm -hmm. Middle plate thickness is irrelevant because, and that's a good point, because the solenoid is going right through it. Mm. So this three here, we should take out of the equation. 38 goes from the bottom. What we need to know in terms of where we're putting our lines here, because if this, if our solid plate is being measured to the top of this line, right. then the middle plate is being measured its bottom to that line, which means that 
the actual place that our corbel goes is five millimeters below that, give or take. And then if we turn around and mark the top of that, then we now say that six millimeters above that is where we want the bottom of the top plate. Yes. We're going to have a whole lot of extra riser left over. We can just chop it right off. It's almost like we have access to a saw. We might have a saw around here. Yeah. Okay. So our corbel goes below this plate, our corbel goes here, and our corbel goes here. And that should comprise all our corbels. Comprise. Okay, so now let's get these measurements transferred over to the second one. Do we have commentary that is incisive and... We've got a couple of different comments coming in here. Uh, okay. Edwin Norlander writes, if you build from the top down, Simon uh, comments as well, uh, measure middle plate to end of pin when fully on. There's probably a few different ways that we could do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see if I'm getting that vaguely straight. So that's corbel line one. Oops. Keep those lined up. That's corbel line two. And swoop. That's corbel line three. Okay. So if we're going to chop these, we probably want to do it before we start gluing things to them. <sighs> How do we do this? Just want to flee the camera long enough to chop these? <laughs> I think we'll, uh, we can do that. That's fine. Uh, I can run over and do it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so any, any recommendation on just how high up? Do you want me to just cut it a little bit of a yeah. little bit, leaving the uh, right off the top? Okay. Sounds good. I'll take these. Okay. I'll run over to the band cell. I'll be right back. Okay, so again, we had all that math in order to try and get the stroke length right, because that's going to control whether or not the solenoids actually grab the pins. If the, if the pin drops too low, we're going to lose it. And if we don't have a long enough stroke length, if we don't try to maximize it as much as we can safely, then we're going to be very soft, because the pin won't have a lot of uh, space to accelerate over. Uh, so hence, math. And I hear the band saw firing up now, so we should be a few seconds away from that. While he's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and get the remainder of the solenoids bolted in to the middle. Looks good to me. My fingers are still in my hands. That is definitely the preferable way to do that. Okay, and the last of these. Dropping that for now. Okay, so now let's start hot gluing our corbels in place. So essentially my high architecture notion here is just that we're going to grab 
a few of these here toothpicks and hot glue them from the bottom because we're going to add more glue on top later to where they come up to that line. Which means I should probably turn that hot glue gun back on for a few seconds. So obviously there's other ways of gluing this as well, but one of the things that we do want to watch out for, especially with our wooden plates, is that wood is known for soaking up uh, glue on the end grain. So if we wanted to get super fancy with this, if we were doing this fine woodworking style, we might apply sizing, that is to say a mixture of half wood glue, half water, and apply that to here, take our time, come back a few hours later, that would soak into the end grain, clog some of it up so that we could actually get a better join later. Um, or a world of other techniques we could be using. We but could, we, could, we could put that out there for the viewers. You guys want us to go that route? Just take a few hours. Just hang yeah. in there. We're going to get some food. Watch the glue dry. Mm -hmm. or, we, or we go the route that you're going to say. Yeah, you know. Again, watching glue dry, glue dry, the exciting part of the show. So let's get that right up to that line. Hot glue gun is presumably hot by now. Can I glue my fingers? Can we have the requisite comedy moment of the show? <laughs> it's going to happen. It yeah. always does. Mm -hmm. There's no way to avoid it. Okay. And now, same thing down here. At this point, one of the viewers has realized a much easier way to do this. And are they telling us? Uh, use hot melt to make shelf, which is... I feel like that's basically what we're doing. Basically what we're doing. You're just adding a little bit of uh, extra, extra structure to it. Yeah. Oh, there, oh, there we, we go. go. Got it. Yep. Wood is glued to finger. Mm-hmm. a good toothpick that's not a good matchstick where did you get these match headless matchsticks from i believe it was some dollar store and they have been my go-to for mixing up epoxy and any kind of thing like that ever since they're a wonderful thing to have around what are they are they designed for crafts or are they designed to make your own yeah. artisan match uh, it, matches I'm sure no one would stop you if you wanted to, to take that approach as well. But uh, yeah, it was just in the craft section of rando dollar store I walked into one day. Uh, prior to that, I had been using uh, bamboo skewers from my local grocery store and breaking those into more uh, yeah, useful sizes. Yeah. Okay, so again, let's give those a few seconds to do their thing. And then, if we've done our math right, it will be time to do the actual gluing. Okay, this could be a place where having two pairs of hands could make the difference. Okay, I'm going to try and move fast. Oh no. Are you going to do all three at the same time? Uh, two anyway. Uh, brave of you. Once we get two of them down, we can hit the other side. We'll have enough structure. Oh, you know what oh. I didn't do? Uh oh. Whee. That was almost. We almost forgot to put our pins in. Yep. 
those have to go in while we're getting these sandwiched together. There we go. Okay. So now let's get this turned on its side. And gently supported as we're going to get our second side on. So applying woo, all the hot glue to that, being kind of generous. And now, if I've gotten this right, Let that sit for a few moments. Glue loves consistent pressure. I'm not being consistent, so maybe I'll stop trying. I'll put some pressure on there. Okay. And then I think, okay, well, the drop level, the, how far it's dropping looks good to me. Yeah. Okay, and so now we just want to get our top piece on. Yep, that was almost our oh, next that disaster. <laughs> that would have been awful. Whee! Okay, that looks plausible. So, incoming with the hot glue. Y'all can know just how badly I messed up the beautiful acrylic face here. It'll be our little secret. Only we will know how badly marred the acrylic has become. Okay, so that is our quick and dirty frame. It's not bad. I actually expected it to uh, have a little bit of bend to it, but this feels pretty solid. You guys can see uh, there's our sandwiched layers. Uh, it looks like the distance makes sense. You, know, you can see on the bottom there, mm -hmm. the uh, our pins are all done. They're all in the relaxed mode. Uh, and then you can see when they go up. If I, if I just rattle this back and forth, it should chime, right? A little, yeah. Okay, very faintly. Very faintly. Okay, so let's start getting things plugged in. So we know that indiscriminately, we can go ahead and plug all of our red wires into the 12 volt power rail. The black wires, we care which MOSFET they go to to get our notes playing. Now we're going to get our remaining three MOSFETs in. Let's go ahead and throw one there. And before I get any distractions, let's go ahead and get... I hate how faint... the cathode marker on this batch of diodes is. Yeah, I'll go back and double check that in a bit. We've got our MOSFETs going into place. We've got our diodes going into place. Yep. Can you put this one one row forward just so they're oh. all in a line? <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to drive me nuts. Absolutely. And, yep. and they're spaced two apart. Three apart. Oh, goodness. The other ones are two apart. We can't be inconsistent. Well, this one's a little bit further, too, but... This is... Oh, OCD. OCD is kicking in! A common condition of our sort of people. Okay, and the last of me diodes. Has it gotten lost in the shuffle? Uh -oh. 
Well, I've got spear under the bench. Okay. Oh. While you're grabbing that, uh, exciting to hear that uh, Weirdo Maker mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, says that uh, he loves it so much, his group's making something similar for the Arts Festival. That's really cool. Awesome. I would love to see that. So if you, uh, if you want to email it to me, uh, information, photos, mm -hmm. videos, uh, I would be happy to see it. My email is mike at makermedia.com. And any of you other viewers that want to send me anything that you're working on, uh, you can also send me an email. Mike at makermedia.com. Super easy. Okay. And now, let's see. Somewhere in here, I've got the glasses that are just dangerous to wear on the air. I mean, no one should be exposed to <laughs> this level of... I love those glasses of yours. I've seen them before. Yeah. This one, you know, it's getting serious. And you know, I'm just sick of squinting. Okay, those diodes appear to all be in the right place. Now, we care um, which of these pins go to what? Which of the uh, which of the grounding wires go to which diode? So I'm going to go ahead and put the D into the first of the row. Then we've got. E. Oop, that already fired. What's up with that? Ooh, nope, nope. this wire needs yeah, stripping. So, well, somebody had a good comment here. What's that? It was Edwin saying, don't forget to set your pin mode for the other pins. Good call, Edwin. Thank you. Those are the sort of reminders that, yeah. MOSFET drain pin, and final grounding wire to the final MOSFET drain pin. Now we're going to need a whole bunch of little black wires to connect the source on the remaining three MOSFETs back to ground. So... Your dumpers for those? Yeah. Fantastic. You know what? Pop those glasses right back on. Boom. And that's coming back up the row. That's our third. And our second. And now we want to get those four pins wired into our microcontroller. So the first one already is, though we're going to shift it over some. Let's see. Do we have male to male? Male to female? If we don't, we can jump into our. Oh, you might have some supplies. Bucket, bucket of jumpers. What do you need? Excellent. Let's get some uh, longer mail to mails. I don't know if we got long ones. I'm not sure. This might take a while. Or did I bring some of my own? I did. Okay. Here we go. Termination. Super tangled up. How about you? Oh, that's what it is. All those are twist tied together. That's why I'm having a hard time reaching. Okay. So, that's not going to be long enough. There we go. So that should be three long enough ones to go from gate to so the very first one. I'm going to move back to three per the original plan. That's the last one. 
So three, four, five, six. And then the ones in between. So the third MOSFET's gate to pin five. Okay, and the second MOSFET's gate to pin four. Okay, so let's do a quick check here. We got four <laughs> floating voltage. Yay. Um, We've got all four gates wired. True? Looks true. Looks like that's drain. That's drain. That's drain. I think that's drain. And source, 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 source. Those are easy to see because they've got the heads. And then we check the diodes before, so this looks all plausible. So, time to check code. Okay. Three, four, five, six, setting up the sonar. Okay. Let's try uploading the code and seeing if the magic happens, although... I, do I have a serial... yep, I've got serial print lines in there. So, if this works on the first try, A, that would be a minor miracle. <laughs> That right. didn't sound good. We've got two pins are up, two pins are down. And they made no noise. Well, That's the... you know, I've got something I'm nervous about. I'm looking What's on that? the side here. Yeah. The hardest part of the build has been getting these shelves in the right places. Uh -huh. I think that we're a couple millimeters off. Because these pins that are up, they're not connecting. So we've got to figure out how to lower that shelf a little bit, perhaps. Okay. Although... That was me. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, so that shouldn't be too hard. Let's go ahead and unplug some things. And if those are not connecting, you know, hot glue being the incredibly strong substance that it is, if I can find something sufficiently small to pry in here. We should just be able to move the corbel down. Little flathead? Yeah, a little slot of screwdriver. Here we go. Okay. So. Hmm. On this side, I'm actually tearing into the wood. The glue is actually doing a better job than I would have given hot glue credit for. Ah! Stuffing it up. Yep, I'm going to deploy the... Swing it around. Yep, that works fast. Okay. So now, on that note, maybe we use that same technique to just shift these corbels down a little bit. Let's try it. Yeah. Let's see, let's put something under them just to support them from falling all the way. And then... Plastic. The risks we take. You can see the glue. It starts to liquefy pretty quick. Okay. So that one we dropped a few millimeters, maybe a millimeter, maybe two. There we go. That looks like a good second approximation. Yeah. 
It's not scientific, but it doesn't have to be. I'll let you heat that one for a little while. Yep, and that's already starting to flow. There we go. You can see that angle better than I can. What do you think of how far that one dropped? Uh, that a little looks more, like a little maybe less. Just a little bit more, just a tad more. Uh, again, I don't think it's going to be a, a huge issue. Yeah. Okay, Hopefully let's give it. Sure. And then we switch the hot glue gun back on. We give that a few seconds to re-solidify before re reheating it. And what we're thinking about it, peel off any residual that's... Ooh. Cram it into place. Here, let me put a little bit of fresh on there. A little bit of fresh, a little bit of fresh. Okay. Facing the right direction? Yes. Okay. So that's lowered a little bit. So, in, most important thing, does it ring? We can already tell the code's a little buggy. In fact, what if I just High, low, everything outputs. Oh, that's not going to succeed in uploading because it's not currently plugged in. <laughs> I like this idea that's getting floated through the, uh, the chat here. What's that? A challenge of upgrading simple kids' toys. Weirdo maker saying bonus points if it's cheap plastic crap you get out of the grocery store machines by the door. That mm -hmm. is a cool idea. Mm -hmm. That would be a lot of fun. Maybe we should talk about that as a. Uh, Mission to make yes. a challenge. Absolutely. Put that in an upcoming issue of Make Magazine. If you guys really like that idea, throw in, uh, throw in your vote in the, uh, in the, in the uh, comment here. Because I think that'd be pretty fun. Starting. Okay. No person detected. So. Our five volt pin come loose. Is that what happened? There, five volts there, ground, ground. I heard something. So the first solenoid is going up just enough to tap back down. Okay. Well, I've got the code set to only fire it for so long. Let's tell it to hold substantially longer. Okay. Uploading. Maybe I wasn't giving it enough time to actually rise. Starting. Whoa! That's hmm. a lot louder than I expected it to be. But it's only ringing the D. Okay. Did you put your pins in for all of them? Ah. In the function that does the ringing, I had it hard coded to D. Okay, starting. Now, hold on before it goes. Is this the song? Is this, is this going to be, if it plays, will it? Well, we hope. Will it play the song that people will discover if you programmed it to play? Well, that would be if it ran bug free. Okay. That would be if I programmed the song uh, correctly from memory to code. Not far off. That's not bad. <laughs> All right. I love it. Okay. So it plays one time. Can you get it to do again? To uh, it's currently set to where if my code's working correctly, it doesn't allow itself to reset until the distance goes greater than 50. And I'm not checking the distance. So let's put a distance check in here. Matthew, do you know what song it is? Did you know already is what I mean? I, I, he told me beforehand, but I forget. So 
one extra egg. It's my, uh, this is one of my favorite songs. I'm still not saying what it is. So let's get some Pirates of the Caribbean close, but not quite. There you go, can you play it again? Uploading with an A taken out, see if that, let's see if I grabbed the right A, because of course the tempo is. Kept the extra A. Put your hand in my ears. <laughs> So you've actually programmed in because you've got the pauses, you've got the notes. Mm -hmm. I'm still not telling people what song that is, but you've uh, you programmed in the timing for this as well. Did you just have? To, did you figure it out on your own? I got some sheet music. Okay. And then you just transposed full notes, half notes, quarter notes mm -hmm. into milliseconds. Interesting. So it still thinks that someone is close, even though no one is close anymore. Oh, because it's not taking a new reading. Of course, that's why. Yay, books. Uh. <laughs> Freebird! <laughs> oh, as an Alabama native, no. I will say this. It is not a Rick roll. No. No. I mean, it's close enough. I feel like one of y'all should recognize oh, it. I, I, yeah, somebody should know this. There we go. And that's as far into the song as we can get without adding uh, some high D's yeah. and C's. Yeah. That's great. Should we tell them what it is? Because anybody guessed it yet? I don't think that anybody said it yet. We've got Pirates of the Caribbean, and we've got a request for Freebird. <laughs> Harry Potter. That's not far off. Not far off. It's a running genre. It's close. Okay. Counting down five, four, three, two, one. Nope. Okay. Are you going to Scarborough Fair? That Beautiful. is our performance for Beautiful. you. Beautiful. That is lovely. That is yeah, lovely. it's been fun. Yeah. So this is our Arduino controlled glockenspiel. The technique you can see if we had a bit more time and maybe, you know, this could have obviously been made a little bit prettier with way more notes, way more sophisticatedly. Um, but for something we threw together in half an afternoon, I'm feeling good. Can I? Yeah. There we go. The roll fair. Uh, that last A needs to go longer. Yeah. <clears throat> Can't hit that note. It's a, it's a, it's a tough one. Remember me to one who lives there. It's by, uh, the question is, who's the song by? It's by Simon and Garfunkel. That's the most recent one? Yeah. Or the most yeah, recent it's, one, it's a, one? Yeah, right. Well, I wouldn't even say it's the most recent. It's probably the most famous for me. Right. There are a lot of, it, it's a historic medieval song that uh, made its way through centuries, uh, but Simon and Garfunkel did a, a version of it that is the one that you'll hear. But if you go on YouTube, you can find a million different versions of this song. Maybe yeah. It's actually, it's a song that uh, most nights when I'm trying to put my son to sleep, it's for. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the last four years, this is the song that we play to help him calm down and go to sleep. So thank you, because it's uh, hey, you, I know you didn't know that, but uh, mm -hmm. this has always been my favorite song. It's one of mine as well. There we go. Yay. That's the tempo at last. Awesome. Okay. Well, it works. Yeah. We did it. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Mike. Robo thank you all for joining us. Yeah, the, uh, I got a lot of people to thank. Yeah, first we'll thank all the viewers mm -hmm. uh, for uh, sticking with us. We got a, a great uh, group of people watching and great comments. So thank you. Uh, it's for you guys that we do this. Mm -hmm. uh, also want to uh, thank uh, DigiKey for being incredible sponsors of uh, of Make Live, keeping this going, helping us put together. Uh, cool projects and inspire people to make their own cool projects. Don't forget to uh, email me with any of the stuff that you guys are working on or things you might want to see in upcoming editions of Make Live. Uh, thank you, Sam, for it's been my pleasure. being an uh, incredible builder, an incredible guest for today. Uh, always so much fun to work with you. Likewise. And, uh, 
uh, and I'm looking forward to doing more. Thank you, Matthew, back there for running the stream. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys. Hopefully you can make it to Maker Fair. So please do. Otherwise, we will see you next month with the next Make Live. And uh, I'm excited to see that. Have a good night. And remember what I told you. Yeah, yeah, don't make eye contact. He takes it as a personal challenge. Hello? Pat? Yes? Can I get a, uh... He'll take a Raspberry Pi 3. <laughs> no pie for you! <laughs> told you. Hey, but I did hear this new deli. I can go pick up the sandwiches. No! Don't be held hostage by the board. Go to digikey.com to find thousands of boards in stock, all ready for immediate shipment.